That's fucking delightful. Fucking delightful. Fucking good combination playing. Sliding balls into space. Good. Excellent. The other one the fucking ball. Hello and welcome to another edition of the Roku Report podcast in association with Sunderland Community Super Kitchen. I'm Bomber and I'm joined across the pond by Kev uh, to discuss a win. Let's just take a moment, a, a pause there, a moment of silence. Yes, a win against uh, second place Wigan Athletic. Kev, I'm sure you are feeling a lot better than you thought you were going to. Yeah, it makes for a, a great Saturday now. I was a little concerned, but uh, this is... Uh, should be some uh, some fun conversation. Yeah, I guess you've got um, you've got a little bit more time than us to celebrate it as well. You've got the rest of the afternoon and the evening. <laughs> yeah, plenty of time. Whole afternoon, all night. It'll be a uh, it'll be a long weekend, that's for sure. But in, in yeah. the best way. And it's been a long time coming in, on, uh, and very much overdue as well. After what was it, six six games now without yeah. a win. This this would have been the seventh, but uh, it's a it's an end to a very very dismal run and a somewhat embarrassing run in places of uh, of six games without a win but we'll we'll crack straight onto it and I'll start Kev with, with the starting lineup pretty much unchanged two quite big changes to be fair but with uh, Jamajli coming in for Doyle which again I think is something that has been a long long time coming and when I saw it on the team sheet part of me was relieved part of me was a little bit concerned in the in the lack of football that he's had and then Embleton in for Defoe which I thought was an interesting one so on seeing those two changes one probably uh, needed to happen and, and the other maybe a little bit more surprising. Did it give you any more or any less confidence that we were going to get anything out of today's game? Yeah, I'll be honest. When I when I saw the team sheet released, I was not happy and not confident in the slightest. Uh, to be honest with you, mm. I thought the bench looked a, a stronger starting 11 than, than the starting 11 did. And so there was a little bit of apprehension, uh, but credit to the, the team that was selected because they came out and they, they put in a, a proper performance. Proved me yeah, wrong, that's yeah. for sure. Yeah, definitely. I mean, I think I'm pretty much the same as you in that I saw that that lineup and was kind of not overly inspired by it. You know, Lyndon Gooch has been out the fold for for a long, long time. Embleton hasn't really he hasn't really played an awful lot, but he's not really set the world alight in in recent weeks. Um, and then, yeah, like you said, you look down the down that bench and you've got Defoe, Dejaku, Dan Neal, Jack Clark, Patrick Roberts, all these exciting players that we've got to who, who can go and create chances and, and score goals for us. And they're, they're sat there, you know, with their, with their track suits on. So I, I was a little bit apprehensive. I was apprehensive anyway, because the form is what it has been. It looked like a different change of formation, a change of system as well. It looked like we were going with a, with a 4-2-3-1 with Embleton, Pritchard and Gooch in behind um, Stewart. Personally, I think that's probably our best formation and our best system. Um, I don't know what you think about that. Yeah, I think it suits our style of play best. And I think immediately at, at the first whistle, you could tell the players were more comfortable in that in that formation mm-hmm. as well because the, the press looked cohesive. The playing from the back and the playing of our midfield out to the wings and up to, to Stewart, it, it looked a lot more cohesive. It looked a lot more uh, like they were familiar with it and comfortable with it. So, uh, yeah, I think it suits us a whole lot better than what, what we've tried in the last couple of games. In yeah. fairness, to get a, a spark going that we needed. Yeah, yeah. I mean, the, the system-wise and the way we played it is it was something that was much more familiar. And for me, you could just tell straight from the off, you know, it's something that the, a lot of the players are, are used to have been playing. It's a system he played under Lee Johnson. And straight away, we just looked a little bit more, you say, a little bit more organised, a little bit more composed. Looked like we were no, knew what we were doing um, that little bit more. Um, but as, as for the game itself, you know, we couldn't have asked for a better start. You know, kick off, Pritchard's fouled, he gets up, <laughs> whips in a free kick. And, and Bailey Wright manages to get free from, I think it was James McLean, actually, of all people. And all he's got to do, really, is get his head on the ball, make that connection, send it goalwards, and he's close enough that the, the keeper can't really do much about it unless unless we hit him. And it's and it's 1-0 out like, of... So everybody's surprised. I barely sat down. I missed missed the <laughs> kickoff itself. And I sat down literally as the free kick's coming in. And, and lo and behold, the, the goal was there. We've noticed uh, the last couple of weeks when we get those first 10, 15 minutes in good possession, good build-up play, and then it all comes to naught and it kind of falls apart for us. But when we can get an early goal like that, it, it does change the way that we play the rest of the game as well. Yeah, and you, you immediately saw, like it's, it's difficult to tell because it's so early. You don't know if that's kind of, that was kind of confidence and attitude going into the game or whether that early goal just sparked that confidence. You couldn't really tell because there was literally no play be- before the goal. But you could just see that after that early goal, everyone just kind of lifted their chins up a little bit, stuck their chests out a little bit more, certainly than, than what we've seen in, in previous weeks. And we just we just looked 
a lot more in control. And, you know, the, the game, the, that first half in particular, it didn't really, the, well, the first 30 minutes aside from the goal, it was a little bit attritional. It was a little bit all in the middle of the park. There weren't a lot of chances that I can remember, certainly none yeah. that um, I can I can think to, to speak about. I think Max Power had a free kick. That was probably about it up until, up until the penalty. Now, for me... In real time, I thought this penalty was really soft. Kind of obviously, we'll take it, we'll take anything we can get at the minute, but I thought it was soft. But then, having watched it back, um, it's quite clear Stewart gets there before, doesn't he? And then, um, I, I can't remember who the defender was, but he's kind of stuck a leg out, not made contact with the ball, and legs kind of come across Stewart. Stewart's fallen over it. I think Stewart's made the most of it, but it was, um, I don't think there's any doubts that it was a penalty. No, I think you're right. I think, you know, like you said, you watch it live and you thought, Oh man, here's another one of these situations where Stewart goes down in the box and the ref's going to let it go and and this may hurt him for the rest of the game. We've seen that so many times even when yeah. he he truly is fouled in the box. We see uh, Stewart's kind of gotten maybe a little bit of a, a bad name for himself for going down sometimes maybe a little bit too easily in the mm-hmm. box. Uh but yeah, like you say, you watch it back and and he does defender does hang a leg out uh, and Stewart is uh, making a move and there's no way he had time to, you know, make you know, too much of nothing. It was a foul. It was in the box. So it's a it's a penalty, and and he takes advantage. Yeah, it's one of those. Isn't it? Anywhere else in the pitch, it's a free kick. So why shouldn't it be a penalty? So that's it. Yeah, but you're you're right, Stuart. He he hasn't had a lot of those. He hasn't had a lot a lot of luck with those in uh, in recent weeks, or pretty much since the, the the start of the season. He had a couple, I think, earlier on in the season, but he he doesn't really get a lot. It took forever as well. So fair play to him for actually taking the penalty because it took forever for the penalty to actually be taken, thanks to the shit of uh, of old Max Power, something that we probably could have done with from him during his spell with us at the club. Uh, but yeah, did his very best to say that the ball wasn't on the spot and then argue with the ref and just do everything that he possibly could to try and put Stuart off. But no, it was one that he, he ended up putting away with quite a lot of confidence in the end and, you know, for 38 minutes on the clock and we're 2-0 up. And I think it was that, I think it was something like this first time in ten games or something like that. That I'm sure I read that somewhere. The first time in ten games that we've scored two in it more than more than one in a game. Yeah, since Wickham, uh, I think. And it was it was pretty solid up until halftime. There was that one chance that I just wanted to to mention that there was a bit of a mix up, wasn't there, between Jamajli and and Patterson, where it looked like he was leaving it for the keeper. But I don't know how you felt, felt about it, Kev. But I didn't think there was any chance that that was even rolling into the box for Patterson to be able to pick it up. Yeah, and it there, just... there was a lot going on out in front of the box, and there was a lot <laughs> yeah. going on in front of uh, in front of Patterson. But I, I will say that moment for me was uh, kind of a moment where my confidence in Patterson has been kind of up and down over the course of the season. But the way he held that in the middle of the chaos, I think it built the rest of the game because the second half he had several mm. uh, really good holds, nothing too major, but some good. Uh, some good solid saves. He stayed in front. He claimed some some balls well, and so I think that was a a huge area of growth that I've seen in him. Because when that goes in, my my heart is in my mouth because that's one of those where Patterson in the past maybe hadn't had as much control over the situation, but he held well and and we got out of it, gotten a halftime uh, with that two goal advantage. Yeah, I'm glad you brought it up actually because it was something that I was going to mention that people have been really really quick to criticise Patterson in, in areas where. He's either made a mistake or people felt he should have done better. But tonight, I thought he was, for what he had to do, which wasn't an awful lot. There was a couple of saves. I think he made a good one-on-one save in the second half from Lang. But the crosses and the free kicks that he came out for and collected when when there's two or three attackers underneath him or on top of him waiting to get on the end of it. I, th- I thought it was a really mature goalkeeping performance from Patterson today. And I think he deserved credit. So I did want to I did want to single him out for that. You know, he Absolutely. did, like I say, didn't have a lot to do. But what he did do, I think he did perfectly. Um... So yeah, so 2-0 at halftime and then just running through the second half, you know, early doors, we seem to go up another gear. It could have been three or four quite early in that second half. Bailey Wright just missed getting on the end of one. I think it was Stewart flashed the ball across and he just missed that. Pritchard as well had a shot which just missed the one outside of the far post. I think we we controlled large parts of the game. I was looking at the stats afterwards and it's actually the first time in a long time that we've had less of the ball than the opposition. I think it was 57-43 to, to Wigan. So it's good to do uh, to other teams what's been done to us yeah. uh, in recent mo- weeks and months. Uh, that first five minutes of the second half, we were so in control. I'll be honest with you, that was the most mm. nervous I was during the entirety of the game because we had those three or four really good chances. And it just seemed like, oh man, is this where 
it's going to be we should have put one or two more away, put the game to bed, and let them back into it. But but fair play after that, we kind of held onto the ball, mm. let them have possession in, in areas that were never going to trouble us. But yeah, those first five minutes when those when those two or three chances didn't fall in the back of the net, I was starting to get a little bit anxious, had to stand up and, and pace a little bit for, for a few minutes after. I was the same because of all the teams, you know, Wigan have done it three or four times this season where yeah. they've gone two goals down and ended up winning 3-2 or drawing 2 all. So I thought the same, yeah, of all the teams to to kind of potentially be punished for not taking your chances, Wigan was, was not one to, to kind of try it out with. But yeah, I think I think we controlled the, the, the second half in terms of we restricted Wigan, we we frustrated them. You could tell, couldn't you, that they they were yeah. frustrated. You could pick out five or six of their players who were, you know, getting quite petulant really in terms of some of our time wasting, okay. Yeah, we we did that. But again, I couldn't care less with that. It's happened to us so many times this season with goalkeepers taking the best part of a minute or 90 seconds to, to kick the ball out. They were throwing themselves down. Yeah, so we definitely got under their skin and they definitely didn't like it. And they're probably not used to it either. They're, I guess they're certainly not used to being to losing a game 3-0. And yeah, they, they did get quite petty with it. Yeah, and I'll say, I thought about halfway through the, the first half, I was certain that the game was going to end with one of the other teams with 10 men because it was just mm. a feisty strong game um and we were you know we were doing a little bit to to get under their skin and for me that was when my mindset kind of changed in the second half and I thought you know what this is a tough hard-nosed um get under the skin of our opponents kind of game that we've been looking for 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 mm-hmm. 3 4 weeks now so yeah that was the the best part of the game just just watching the players stay down and and watching Wigan just continue to compound their frustration as as the minutes kind of ticked off the clock. Yeah, there was definitely a, a, a bit of heart and a, and a bit of determination, a bit of steel that's that's been missing for for a long while now. And then the the, the game kind of kind of winds down. It looks like we're gonna see out the game, keep a clean sheet, win two 0 and then and then all of a sudden another penalty, which was kind of out of nothing. It was a, a cross. I think it was Dirikwa. Just kind of it's a bit strange when his his hand was way above his head, and it just seemed to like it, I know he wasn't, but it looked like he was just kind of punching the ball out yeah. and again it was one of those in real time and I think uh, Frankie and Danny on the commentary were the same they were like well what, what's he given that for and then the replay it was quite obvious it was going to be another penalty and it was handball and the thing I thought which was hilarious about that was uh, was Lyndon Gooch acting as bouncer slash security guard <laughs> stood, stood behind uh, Ross Stewart protecting the penalty spot making sure that no one was coming to try and put him off and it was another very very well taken penalty wasn't it? Yeah, it was. Yeah, I mean, credit to, to Stuart, the two ch- chances that he got from the spot. It was calm, cool, collected, uh, easy finishes, really. It, I mean, it, it looked like he didn't even he didn't even think twice about what he was doing, and, and he put him away. Um, and, and I will say Gooch was the one that I had pinned for us that, that had the potential yeah. to get send off before <laughs> yeah. before the game was over because he, w- he seemed to be in and around every situation uh, where the ref kind of had to pull players uh-huh. aside. And I thought, oh, man, he, he's going to find himself sent off and, and put us in, a, in an interesting situation for the run-in. But, but yeah, that's part of that toughness to kind of close the game out. And the penalty was a strange one because my first thought was when the whistle was blown that uh, he's called for offsides or, or a foul on Stewart in the box. And then when yeah. you watch it back, you're exactly right. It looks like he, he took his hand and just maybe in frustration just punched the ball out and he knew yeah, he could it was... the head on it. It's a strange one. But we'll take yeah, it. it was it was odd, but yeah, I take I take your point with Gooch as well. I thought if anyone was going to be sent off, it was going to be him. There was a moment kind of right near the end where I can't remember who it, who it was, but I think it might have been might have been Tom Naylor, or it might have been Gooch was shielding the ball out for a goal kick, and he went down really easy, and he was kind of gesturing him to get up. And then I just saw, I think it was Bailey Wright just come sprinting across, grabbed Gooch and just kind of threw him out of the way. I was just like, go away, just just yeah. go away. Yeah, Bailey knew. Um, he knew. <laughs> um, and and then. Uh, the other thing was eight minutes added time at the end of the game. What on earth was was all that about? <laughs> yeah, that was strange. I know there was a lot of uh, there was a lot of uh, altercations. You know, there was a lot of of uh, kind of uh, cheap soft fouls. I guess where mm-hmm. where game was kind of stop start, but eight minutes seemed like I thought, oh, this game is going to go on for an eternity. They're they're giving yeah. them the opportunity to put two or three back in. Yeah, it was a, it was a, it was a strange one. Because um, you, you can guarantee, if we were, if that was a game at the Stadium of Light and we were losing two nil or three nil, and a team had been te- time wasting against us for the whole time, we'd be looking at two minutes of added time. We wouldn't be looking at eight. Yeah, I feel like we've watched that game before, where it's you know Stadium of Light and and they're <laughs> yeah. kicking the ball out, they're holding the ball out of play, and the the board goes up, and you're thinking, oh, surely four or five at least minutes added it's on, two. and it's yeah. two every time. Yeah. But yeah, we'll uh, we got we got it across the line, so you can't complain. Too yeah. Much. 
We did, yeah. We're at three now. You'd like to think that we're not going to concede three in the last eight minutes. So even though it was a bit of a shock, it wasn't all that nervy in the end. So there you have it. It was three now. First win in February and only, I think, the second in 2022. So, Kev, what, what do you think was present today that's been missing in the last six, seven games? What was it about us that led to that result? Because... I'm sure you're the same as me and probably 90% of, of the Sunderland fans in thinking that, you know, if we could get away with a draw, it would be a miracle. And I don't think anyone was expecting anything. So what was the difference for you today? Yeah, I don't know if it was the preparation um, leading up to the game. Um, the fact that it was such a big game in terms of, you know, who we're playing and how far ahead of us they seem to be. Uh, if it was that early goal, it could be a whole host of things. Maybe it's a combination of all of them, uh, but it seemed like there was a little bit more desire uh, on the pitch from the players. You could see they were uh, really pressing with everything that they had in a way that, you know, it may have been half-hearted in the last couple of games. When a player would get beat, like Serkin got beat a couple of times uh, down that left-hand side early on, he didn't hang his head. Uh, he just kept on and got right back after it again. The the defense kind of picked each other up uh, when somebody would step out. I think for whatever reason, this team seemed to have that collective spirit to just get us over the line in a, in a massive, massive game. And it seems to be that, you know, the way the fixture list lines up, this could be a catalyst for us to maybe not push on for one of those top two spots, but definitely finish the season strong. And I think in seasons past, we've seen the dip from this point in the season towards the mm. end to where we go in the playoffs and, you know, kind of so-so form. But if we can carry this on the rest of the season, we could be as dangerous a team as we all thought we were maybe two or three months ago. Yeah, there's a chance that it's kind of too little too late, I think, certainly for, for the automatics. But I'll, I'll come on to where that takes us because there's a couple of performances that I wanted to kind of single out. Now, obviously, firstly was Arby Jamajli. I think he's played two games in 18 months, came with quite a bit of promise. Not played a league game. I think he just played. He played a friendly in a Papa John's Trophy game. Yeah. Calendar had to come out of the team, and you would have thought probably Danny Bart was the one to come in, but he wasn't in the squad at all today. So I can only assume he's struggled with injury still. So yeah, but I thought the first kind of 10, 15 minutes he looked a little bit uncomfortable, but after that, you know, he was throwing himself about. He was physical. He was winning all the headers. Him and Bailey Wright, considering I can't remember if Bailey Wright played in either of the games that he was in, but considering they pretty much, at best, they played 90 minutes together. Right. They seemed to have a good understanding. They communicated well. I was actually really, really pleasantly surprised and really impressed with his performance today, given the magnitude of the game and the level of opposition. What yeah, did you he think? got thrown into the to the fire. I mean, first league game, mm. and it's it's wigging away yeah. with us, like kind of grasping for our playoff lives. And credit to him, he stepped up to the task, and he looked excellent. I mean, he really, like you said, bar those first kind of few minutes as he was kind of feeling his way into the game, that partnership between him and Bailey Wright was unstoppable. And for what we heard in the pregame lead up from Wigan fans that they have these uh, kind of center forwards who like to bully center mm -hmm. halves and get them off the ball, they stood up to the task and some. Uh, I mean, they really, uh, the Wigan strikers didn't have a sniff at goal. All their chances came from, you know, wide players or a little bit of a midfield buildup. So yeah, excellent revelation he could be. Uh, to the run end of the season, if he can keep that level of performance up. Yeah, I mean, let's let's certainly hope so. I'll not get too carried away just yet because we've done it so many times of <laughs> raving about a centre back who's had a good performance. I think I remember specifically Ali Mozturk against Doncaster at the stadium, like a few seasons back, it was the performance of his life. And then you know we were never seen, never saw that level <laughs> of performance ever again. So I won't be too quick to judge. But you know, if that's the level of performance that we can expect from him then I've got no qualms with him coming in and, and kind of rotating between him Doyle and, and Bailey Wright for the rest of the season if need be yeah and look if he can come in and, and give those two guys a rest in the run in kind of have a three-man rotation there for the two mm -hmm. center half positions that that'll be worth the entirety of him coming back just in itself if he can just give those guys a breather and between the three of them they can kind of shore it up in the in the run in yeah and I bet there's no person more delighted with a with that performance than than Callum Doyle because it probably means he can <laughs> have a bit more of a rest as well that's it yeah yeah, and the other person I wanted to single out as well, and not necessarily just for this game, but we've been pretty damn awful for the last few games. Kev, how good and how influential is Jay Matete? Oh man, he is becoming my favourite player to watch. Yeah. <laughs> I find myself in, in games just watching him off the ball. 
Uh, not even, you know, if the, the action is, is away from him, I'm just watching him because his movement is so good mm-hmm. off the ball. He's putting himself in a position where he can be helped for the buildup. But if we turn the ball over, he's in exactly the right place to win it back. And the way he yeah. flies into tackles is one of those things that we've been missing in the midfield for the whole season. And so, uh, yeah, it, it is so much fun to watch him fly around the pitch. And I think that early yellow card may have even robbed us of seeing a little bit more of that as the game went on. Cause you could tell he was trying to be a little bit cautious sitting yeah. on the yellow, but gosh, is he fun to watch? Yeah. He's been, he's been absolutely brilliant. And like you said, he's been the one thing that we've been missing in the middle at that middle of midfield. And he's, he's not just physical, you know, he's willing to throw himself a bait. He puts his body on the line, but he's clever with it as well. Like you say, he gets into the right positions to not just have to make last ditch tackles, but to intercept passes and, and, you know, be in a position that, even if he's not affecting play, if we win it back, he's in. A, he's then in a position to receive the ball and drive forward with it. And that's the other thing I like as well is that he gets the ball and he sees. If he sees some space in front of him, he'll just drive into it. It's very, very rare that you know he makes a wrong decision with the ball. There's a, there are a couple of times, and today I think he did it as well. There are a couple of times where he he'll give the ball away trying to pass out wide that doesn't quite come off. But the one thing that I will say with that is I don't, I don't recall any time where he's given the ball away in a place where it's critical that you don't give the ball away. You know, he, he's yeah. giving stuff, he, he's giving possession away, trying to do things to advance our cause rather than making a wrong decision or kind of dithering on the ball and, and giving it away. I've been so impressed with him. And I know, know the team in yeah. general has been pretty dire for, for the last, you know, three or four weeks. And I think one of the things he does so well is makes players around him better. Uh, yeah. as well like he took the pressure off Corey Evans today and we saw Corey mm-hmm. Evans do what a little bit more of what we kind of expected him to be able to do he could sit deeper he didn't have to fly into those tackles he didn't have to drive the ball forward he, he was kind of a safety net at the back end of midfield and he was able to do that well today because of all the work that Matete was doing and so I mm-hmm. think if he continues to do that it's going to benefit Evans it's going to benefit uh, Dan Neal it's going to benefit our wide players it's going to you know, everybody just is, is going to have their level of play raised by him. And it's a, it's yeah. a really, really good thing to watch. Yeah, 100%. The only thing that I would say that he needs to probably consider is the bookings. Because I think he's played four yeah. games now and picked up three, maybe even four bookings. He's been at the club for four weeks and he's in danger of a one-match suspension already. <laughs> right, yeah. But yeah, I, I, other than that, I can't, I can't fault him. So yeah, it's a, it's a 3-0 win. It's a, it's a good performance. Where do we go from here, Kev? Because as good a performance and a result it is, it's almost... Like I was saying, it's a bit too little, too late in terms of the automatics. Unless you think otherwise, what, what, what do you think? Where do we go from here? Well, the, the league has been, I was just thinking about this before we kicked off. The league has been so unpredictable this year as far as teams at the top, other than Rotherham. Uh, and now as Wigan has kind of charged up with their games uh, that they've had in hand, it's been so unpredictable. You know, Plymouth was flying high early in the season. They fell off. Wickham looked to be a team that was, you know, charging towards the automatics and they've fallen off. And I can't help but let the positive side of my brain wonder that if maybe this might be a catalyst for Wigan with the a massive amount of games that they have in front of them to kind of get in in such a short period of time, if this might be, a, a, you know, one of those things that leads to maybe a, a bobble in form that's enough for the rest of the league to, to catch up. The only problem now is there's so many teams that are so close that mm. if Wigan do bobble, it's not 100% sure that it's going to be us that take that that spot away from them. So, uh, yeah, I think maybe too little too late to catch them in, in reality. And even if they do bobble, it may be too little too late for all those other teams around us to maybe step up into that spot as well. But I think what it does guarantee is – a little bit of confidence for us moving into to our next fixture, which I think is the only thing that we're going to be able to think about at this point. There's one more game at a time, and it puts the pressure on teams around us, uh, and it gives us an opportunity to to be in good form come season end, whether that be uh, a realistic chase for the top or um, a really good run in leading into the playoffs, which I don't know about you, but I think Alex Neal is suited for that. He, he's proven himself. Mm-hmm to be a good playoff manager. So that may put us in a, in a pretty good situation form uh, plus the type of manager who knows how to get the job done in the playoffs. It it may work in our favor and the season may not be spoiled uh, like some were fearing it was uh, in the lead up to this one just yet. Yeah, definitely. I mean, there's, there's a part of me, I I know we're only what less than an hour after the final whistle. So we're all kind of high on the, 
on the <laughs> adrenaline of a, of a 3-0 win. So part of me is thinking, oh, you know, if uh, if Wigan go on a bad run now, because like, like we said, they were quite rattled and they've got a, a lot of games yeah. to play. So it stands, there is a possibility that they, you know, their season kind of falls apart. It would be wishful thinking and we'd need a million and one things to go our way for it to happen. But yeah, I think more realistically, we're gearing up for a playoff push and... I, I agree with you. I think Alex Neal, if we were going to go into the playoffs, Alex Neal is the type of man who, who would take a team into the playoffs and do enough to get the job done. From what I've heard from the likes of Gav, etc., and, and some of the podcasts that, that we've put out and some of the conversations we've had with fans of clubs who, who he's managed, you know, he works really hard and he's at those one-off games, he's, he's really, really good. So I think more than any season previous, I'd be as confident going into the to a playoff run than I would have an under any of the other managers that, that we've had whilst we've been in League One. Just some of the other fixtures then. So obviously we've done we've done MK Dons a massive favour today. We've done Rotherham a massive favour today. Both of them uh, ended up winning against Bolton and, and Plymouth respectively. Sheffield Wednesday also won. Oxford won. So actually we've had to pull that result out of the bag just to stay in touch with everybody else. So it just made that result all the more important. And just looking at the league table, now we've got Rotherham kind of running away with it at the minute, 75 points. Then it's Wigan, 66. MK Don's also on 66, but Wigan have got three games on them. Uh, Then it's Oxford in fourth on 62, and then we're 59 in fifth. But then we've got Sheffield Sheffield Wednesday, 58. Plymouth, 56. Wickham, 55. And then there's a little bit of a gap. Ipswich in ninth down to 53. But the, the worrying thing is that Sheffield Wednesday, Plymouth, both got two games in hand. On us. So if they were to pick up maximum points from those games in hand, it would see us drop back out of the playoffs. But, it, you know, we've shown that we can do it now. And hopefully that result today and that performance today will, will lift spirits and, and give us that confidence going into the last 11 games of the season. Yeah, and hopefully it, it, it allows us to kick on in the next four games that we've got. Because we've got, we've got Cheltenham away, uh, Fleetwood and Crew at the Stadium of Light and then Lincoln. So, I mean, if you look at that, forget our previous form up until today if we can take today and have the confidence those teams are, are teams that we should be getting good results from we should be getting three points from and if that happens you know you put five straight wins together who knows what the rest of the league's going to do who knows what Wigan ahead of us is going to do we may be uh, sitting here talking in a, in a fortnight's time and be a whole lot more confident than we even are now who, who knows what those fixtures uh, hold for us so Maybe I'll come off it uh, in the next hour or two post match. Maybe maybe reality will flood back come into my mind. Off the <laughs> but right now, I, I feel like we could we could go on and, and really make a, a mess of things for the teams around us, and maybe even for Wigan yeah. as we kick on to the end of the season. Yeah. So just, just finally, just looking at those games. So as you said, we got Charlton next, who who have lost all of the last six games, so they're in a terrible run of form. But in true Sunderland fashion, we tend to be the <laughs> team that end those sorts of runs for other teams. And then Lincoln and Fleetwood, who are, who are sat 18th and 19th, respectively. Fleetwood, no wins in six. Lincoln, one win in six. So yeah, you know, if we can take confidence from this and, and you know, we can see it as a bit of a catalyst and a kickstart, kick at the backside to bigger and better things, there's no reason why we shouldn't be aiming for, you know, nine points from those next three games. I know the, the previous six games before today would suggest otherwise, but, you know, <laughs> you're only as good as your last game and all that. So... Uh, yeah, so I'm certainly going into it with a bit of a renewed optimism that, that we can take maximum points from those games. And then who knows? It's, it's kind of one of those, isn't it, that we just need to keep churning out results and not worrying about what other people do because it's, it's completely out of our hands now. But. Yeah, it's it. Go week to week. Look at, the, look at the fixtures in front of us. Get maximum points and, and just look at them one at a time. And who knows where yeah. we'll end up. Yeah. Okay, we'll wrap that up then. Thanks very much, Kev. And uh, go and enjoy the rest of your afternoon and your evening. Those extra few hours celebrating the win. That's it. Cheers, Mama. That's right. Cheers. Well, I'm a golden, I don't know. Well, I'm a hidden, I'm searching all, and always I am on my way.